2019 by Pavel Kofton, Sasha Grothenov, uh, Petr Tadic, uh, and myself. Uh, and by the way, uh, let me just mention that uh, Petr Tadic uh, is uh, currently looking for a postdoctoral position and is a very uh, talented physicist, so please keep this in mind. Uh, and also the, uh, the paper uh, published in 2016 uh, by Sasho uh, Nikos Kaplis and um, uh, myself. Um, okay, so now. Uh, uh, this is uh, the audience, of course, who doesn't need any um, kind of motivation to study holography, but nonetheless, let me just show this uh, one kind of propaganda type slide, uh, which uh, is, is supposed to emphasize that um, what we are doing is, is ultimately related, maybe indirectly, to various experimental programs and uh, various theoretical advances of the last two decades. And I would like to emphasize the uh, experimental side of this uh, program. So we have uh, a number of experiments on heavy ion collisions at RIC, which continue for 20 years already, and LHC, which continue for about 10 years. But also I would like to emphasize future collider experiments, which will be done um, in Germany at the Collider Fair and um, uh, in Dubna in Russia at the future collider Nika, heavy ion colliders who will have various characteristics uh, which would allow to study different regimes of coagulant plasma. And uh, I think we should, we should be aware of the fact that, that these colliders are coming online. And that's, that's an important uh, uh, thing for theorists to, to keep in mind. So um, uh, there is um, uh, various accounts of uh, how this uh, uh, coagulant plasma story is related to theoretical advances are uh, published, in particular, there is this uh, book by Ramashke and Ramashke, right? And uh, also various reviews, such as a review by Krishnan collaborators on heavy ion collisions. And uh, I will not say more about this. So all, we all know that there is, a, uh, there, is a one, there is one characteristic which unites these, um, uh, these experimental uh, advances. And uh, the characteristics is that they're dealing with strongly interacting uh, systems uh, in or out of equilibrium, and uh, these systems may be relativistic or not, but uh, strong interaction is one thing which unites them all. And of course, there is gauge in duality, which is a common advance to, uh, to deal, to a tool to study strongly interacting quantum systems of a particular class, but, but that's, that's good enough. So, um, um, uh, I will focus uh, in this talk on a rather simple uh, question. So we all know that hydrodynamics is an effective theory valid at long distances and large, uh, long times and large distances. But there is a question of what are these large uh, uh, distances and long times and what actually sets the limits of hydrodynamics. I think this question is uh, theoretically quite interesting. And in particular, within this question, we can ask um, what happens to the dispersion relations of hydrodynamic modes, the gapless modes, such as the shear diffusion mode with a dispersion relation shown here, and the sound mode, uh, which uh, has a dispersion relation which starts with uh, linear Q. So, so these are modes which are given by infinite series in uh, spatial momentum, powers of spatial momentum squared, and uh, one may naturally ask uh, a question whether these series uh, converge, and if so, what determines the radi radii of convergence? So does the effective theory somehow uh, knows the, the, the limits, right? So one very primitive example is um, uh, the dispersion relation for a relativistic particle. So imagine that we knew nothing about the uh, uh, special theory of relativity, and we, we didn't know that dispersion relation would look like square root of p squared plus m squared, right? So I normalize, I subtracted m here just to, to start with p, right, p squared. And suppose we didn't know that, right? And, and in, some, in some very painful investigation, we would start learning the coefficients of the small p expansion, right? So the first, the second, the third, and so on. And then somebody would discover that the series actually diverges at a certain value of p. Um, then um, this uh, divergence would um, uh, uh, somehow convey to us that uh, this description fails at uh, a given value of p. And this given value of p is, of course, set by the non-analyticity of the actual expression. 
which is uh, located at complex value of p. So in principle, you would never you would never be able just to see to detect it by conventional means, so to speak, from from the series because the function because because the function looks uh, uh, fine at p equal to m, but uh, but nonetheless there is this divergence. So um, then so this is the same question one can ask about the hydrodynamic series if there is a certain value of momentum which sets the radii of convergence for the dispersion relation in hydrodynamics in general, in general, in, in, in weak coupling and kinetic theory and so on and so forth. So thanks to holographic duality, these questions can be investigated uh, quantitatively and uh, analytically, uh, at least for some uh, quantum field theories. So just to give you one motivational slides about the uh, interpolation between weak and strong coupling in general, right? So I keep stressing this that uh, in one and the same theory, for example, in n plus four supergrand mills, in principle, we should be able to at least qualitatively to understand how things change from weak coupling to strong coupling. And in particular theories, uh, in particular questions which are related to, uh, uh, to not only to thermodynamics, but to, 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 to uh, uh, states uh, away from equilibrium can be in principle investigated uh, in this way. So here is uh, an old and beautiful example from uh, Ericsson, Simonov and Zaremba, which is 20 years old, right? And one of the very rare uh, examples of an exact answer in such a situation, right? An expectation value of a circular Wilson loop in n equals four superand mills in four dimensions in the limit of infinite uh, infinite number of colors, but exactly in lambda in hot coupling, right? So the expression is given by a modified Bessel function, which happily can be evaluated at weak coupling perturbatively, right? And gives this result. And then non perturbatively is in the symbolic series at strong coupling, and it coincides with, uh, with, with holographic calculation of strong coupling and perturbative calculation at weak coupling. So sadly enough, uh, we don't have such exact results at finer temperature, right? So even even the free energy, uh, we 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 don't have uh, we don't have a full interpolating function at infinite NC. Not to mention transport and and and, uh, and uh, other other stories. So so this is complicated. Then uh, another motivation of slide is this unreasonable effectiveness of hydrodynamics, uh, which uh, people like to talk about, right? So uh, let me just say that um, uh, if we have uh, in holog by holographic means we have uh, uh, an option to look at the full nonlinear evolution uh, of uh, a given uh, system, maybe a rather exotic system. And this full nonlinear evolution tells us how the components of the energy momentum tensor, for example, T not not component, which in equilibrium will be the energy density of the system, evolves as a function of time. And this has been done in a number of uh, impressive papers, in particular the one by Chesler and Yatha and, and, and subsequent work. And it, it, it shows that in some situations, at least, uh, hydrodynamics works pretty well, in fact, unreasonably well, in the situations when we don't have local from dynamic equilibrium. So here you can see that uh, the, pressure, the pressure gradients are still quite large, but hydrodynamics, which is denoted by this uh, uh, dashed line, uh, uh, coincides pretty well with the, with the so-called exact evolution extracted by, by this holographic duality. Right, so it's 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 interesting to understand why this is so and what sets the bounds for uh, this effectiveness. So um, uh, I will not discuss a number of relevant issues in this talk. Nonetheless, these issues are very interesting, and for those uh, who who are interested, I provided some references here. Uh, so uh, there is this uh, whole story about the causality problems in relativistic hydro and resolution of these problems. Uh, which has been achieved in a rather impressive uh, uh, series of works by uh, Kofton collaborators and then by Naronian collaborators. And all of this is, is an ongoing, in some sense, uh, uh, ongoing work, as you can see from the dates of publications. The second part is the convergence, divergence, resurgence, and all sorts of variations of this word in the position space. So I will not talk about position space. Uh, this is a rather subtle issue, right? So you can have convergence in the momentum space, and then you may ask what happens in the position space, right? And as we know, uh, um, uh, Michal Heller and many, many collaborators uh, of uh, Michal and various combinations, which are from, uh, at least all the, all the papers on the subject. So they investigated, for example, in Birkin flows, the issues of these uh, divergences, the uh, symptotic series, the resummations, and so on. So this is a wonderful, wonderful story, which I will not uh, will not touch. 
right? And that that's a that's a separate uh, a separate piece, although it is related to in principle to what what I'm going to discuss. And then finally, a related piece uh, to this is the relation to the singularity theorems in general relativity and uh, um, uh, stability analysis. So I just I just give one uh, one reference to this recent paper by the Fermas and company, uh, where relatively recent, uh, where they uh, they discuss the stability of the uh, Schwarzschild black holes. The and and this is related to this convergence in position space because it's all related to the class of functions which you deal with in in the position space and so on. So it's functional analysis. But again, so I won't I won't touch this. All right. So. So let's let's just let's just focus on on on, on one simple thing, right? So where what what limits the convergence of these dispersion relations? Now, um, fundamental degrees of freedom in hydro densities are conserved charges, and equations of motion are conservation laws plus constitutive relations, right? Uh, here we don't touch the another issue. It's the issue of the so-called long time tails, or non-analyticities which in holographic quantum appear at finite n c, right? So for us, n c is infinite. And we don't deal with these issues in real life. Of course, these issues are present, and in some sense, they, uh, uh, strictly speaking, they they will invalidate everything I'm going to say. Right? But but uh, we can happily separate having this parameter and see we can separate these two uh, issues uh, one from another. Right. So 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 for us, hydra will be constitutive relation. So this will be Taylor expansion in gradient expansion without any non-analyticities in frequency. Uh, 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 for example, which, which is related to these long time tails. Okay, so uh, the typical expansion for uh, constitutive relation for uh, for relativistic Timmy nu uh, looks uh, like this, right? It enters with a number of transport coefficients, which are, de de which are defined by microscopic theory. So uh, in the conformal case, uh, we, uh, to first order, we only have uh, shear viscosity, then to second order, there are five more coefficients. And then you can go on and, 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 and investigate more and more uh, terms in these expansions. And in fact, I think only third order expansion has been investigated so far by Grosanov and Kaplis. And that some people may say it's not even uh, uh, fully complete. But nonetheless, we know that the number of transfer coefficients will grow with the number of, uh, of, of terms. And uh, this growth is, uh, we probably don't know how fast they're growing. Uh, this number is growing, but, uh, but it's, um, it's, it's, uh, it's clear that the number, uh, the number increases fairly fast, right? So there are 20 relevant structures in the conformal case, con uh, tensor structures, and 68 in non-conformal one for third order hydro, and uh, uh, possibly far more in, in the fourth and, and so on. But, uh, and, and yes, and, and from that you can, you can, you can, you can derive the physical, the physical dispersion relation, right? For example, for sound, right? So here at the bottom, we have a, the um, um, dispersion relation for the sound wave to third order hydro, right? So it contains the usual beginning, right? The linear in momentum, then the k squared term, this is all known. And then there is k cube and then k to the fourth. And these guys, they contain the transfer coefficients which come already from the third order hydrodynamics. All right. So uh, uh, before sort of coming to the main uh, uh, main topic of this discussion, let me just mention our precursors. Uh, so obviously, every work has <laughs> precursors. So, uh, so in um, our case, there was a series of works by uh, Michel Lublinsky, uh, which uh, investigated uh, the uh, uh, all order hydro uh, resummations, and that was that was quite uh, quite important for us to understand what we were doing for a number of years. And then uh, there was a very interesting paper by Ben Bivers in 2018, uh, where uh, a finite density, so it was Reisner Nordstrom ADS4 black brain background. And uh, uh, we were in some sense motivated by that paper to understand um, why n equals four superant males uh, with zero chemical potential wouldn't follow the, the pattern that was investigated in, in Ben's paper. All right, so now uh, finally come to the, <laughs> come to the actual uh, to the actual uh, uh, substance of, of, of the discussion. So uh, we consider relativistic hydra to all orders, to all orders, right? So what do we have? We have expectation value of T mu nu. Expectation value of T mu nu is a function uh, which has an equilibrium value and we can consider, so if we, if we settled with some equilibrium uh, configuration, right? And we, we understand very well what this equilibrium uh, means. Uh, then we can discuss fluctuations, small fluctuations around this equilibrium state. 
right? So for example, the typical, uh, so we will be talking about the simplest possible situation in which our uh, equilibrium state is uh, homogeneous and isotropic, right? So, so everything will be extremely simple. So in that case, equilibrium T menu will have this form of diagonal uh, epsilon PPP where P is a pressure, epsilon is energy density. And what we want to understand is the fluctuation of this T menu on this equilibrium, uh, on this equilibrium state. Now, fundamental degrees of freedom are densities of conserved charges, which means T naught naught, right, in our, uh, in our language, and then, and then T naught I, right? So there are four of them, four variables. So all other components should be expressed for them and the derivatives via a constitutive relation. Now, to linear order in fluctuations, and in Fourier space, one can write down the expression the, for constitutive relation for all other components, delta T i j, via our fluctuations of the densities of conserved charges, just looking at the symmetries of our problem, right? We know that there is an isotropy, right? And, and things like that, right? So, 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 so just by looking at, it, at the tensor structure of the objects, we can write down the generic formula which again, so this does not imply any gradient expansion, right? This is completely generic. The only requirement is that we are linear in fluctuations. So we have uh, these tensor structures, right? And then in front of them, there are functions A, B, C, D, and E. And these functions will depend on omega and Q squared. Q squared because the system is isotropic, so it cannot depend on, on components of momentum alone. It, it depends on the full length of the momentum, uh, momentum um, uh, uh, vector, right? So, so this is, in some sense, I mean, everything else follows from here, right? So we have a generic formula, right? And then if we want, we can expand this expression in powers of uh, momentum Q, right, uh, around, around zero. Uh, and this will give us derivative expansion. So, for example, to first order, to first order um, in uh, to first order in, in hydrodynamic gradient expansion, we just expand this A, B, C, and D right to first order in gradients, and we will get expression for delta T i j in the following form, right? Uh, where you can easily identify what is what, right? So by comparing these two formulas, but uh, uh, this reminds us of the standard relativistic hydro expression consistent relation for delta T i j, right? To first order in hydro. But again, so we don't want to do it, right? We don't want to work with a full expansion without assuming this, this, gradient, this gradient series. So then fine, so we have constitutive relation and we have equation of motion, which is conservation of T menu. And then we combine the formula above, the constitutive relation with the, cons with the conservation equation, uh, D mu T menu equal to zero. And we get a four by four matrix equation for the fluctuations of our fundamental degrees of freedom, delta T naught naught and delta T naught I, right? This matrix can be easily computed. And obviously to get an untrivial solution, we must have a determinant of this matrix being equal to zero, right? So if you have a relativistic homogeneous and isotropic neutral fluid in D plus one dimensions, then computing this uh, matrix will give you uh, this determinant, right? Computing this determinant will give you the following expression so this expression naturally factorizes. It has uh, one piece to power d minus one, and then, it, then there is a second piece which is quadratic in omega, and this whole thing is supposed to be equal to zero, right? These functions, gamma eta, gamma s, and h, are related to the original functions a, b, c, d, and e in the constitutive relations, and of course they are not known. So for a given microscopic theory, these functions must be computed by by microscopic means, right? So but but we don't need this. We just, we just have this general analysis of uh, how the series will look like. So fine. So we will call this determinant, right? This, uh, let's call it P now. Uh, we call it a, a, a spectral curve, right? It's a term unfortunately used in many other contexts, but uh, let's just do it, right? So we have two hydrodynamic spectral curves. One is the shear curve here, F shear equal to this thing equal to zero. And then there is a sound curve, right? So then we treat them as complex curves. And uh, uh, this is a crucial step, right? So, so we have these, these two curves, which would give us dispersion relation in principle. Uh, uh, but uh, in order to understand the analytic uh, properties of these dispersion relation of the series, uh, we have to treat them as uh, curves in complex space. So our omega and Q squared, not Q, Q squared, are promoted 
to uh, complex variables. So this is a complex curve in the space C2. All right. OK. So yeah. sorry. Yeah. Hi, Andre. Yeah. I can ask a question. Of course. So here you have this uh, shear channel and, and um, this gamma eta, of course, the lowest order in omega eta will be a constant and that's the diffusion mm -hmm. uh, kernel, right? Yeah. Now, uh, of course, having a diffusion kernel is sort of bad uh, concerning to, with causality, right? How does this get repaired here? Uh, it doesn't. Uh, so we, we are not, uh, so this is, um, uh, the uh, the causality issues, right? So so uh, is um, um, is uh, in in some sense is a separate um, is a separate story, right? So we have to so we know that yeah. So uh, uh, relativistic hydro will be a causal, right? And uh, kind of naively, let's say let's say naively a causal, and it's not a physical uh, problem because this causality comes at the values which are not compatible with the regime of of applicability of, of, of Hydra, right? But uh, from a point of view of the presence, so, 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 so basically what I want to say is, is the following, whatever you write as a constitutive relation, right? Will enter this gamma. So this gamma is, is not secret. If you have a scheme like Kofton, for example, right? If you have a scheme in which, uh, in which your constitutive relation will be the most general constitutive relation uh, in uh, so I don't want to enter this issue of frames, right? So in, in, yeah. in, in a given frame, so you will get you will get the appropriate gamma, right? So the statement yeah. is that physical results should not depend, of course, on the on this choice of frame. And that's... Yeah. No, but what confuses me is that you have not assumed the derivative uh, derivative expansion here, and Th that's right. Yes. Right? Yes. But, so usually but, but, we say, yeah. well, this arc causal behavior is outside the validity of the derivative expansion, but this seems to be an exact statement here. The only uh, thing yes, yes. Uh, so, so uh, what? Well, so, yeah, yeah. So, okay. So, so far, we haven't assumed anything except the um, uh, except the fact that we have an equilibrium with given symmetries and small fluctuations on top of this equilibrium, right? Now, and and linearity, right? So, our fluctuations are linear. Uh, we do not assume a specific gradient expansion, which can be different as, as we just discussed, right? So it, it can be it can be chosen. In different... Even here, I mean, if you do that, you see, my point is presumably you assume the gamma eta to be analytic in omega and q squared. Yeah, that's that's a very yeah, that's a very subtle yes, yes, yeah. that's right. So that's right. when you do that, yep. you know. It's very hard to get rid of, of how, how do you get rid of the uh, causality? I mean, because as you said, you assumed equilibrium mm -hmm. and you assumed uh, linearity, right? Yes. And that's all you assume. Yeah. So, so, uh, so, uh, so somehow, so, you know, usually I assume you, you also assume derivative expansion and then yeah, things uh, go wrong and you but here you don't even assume this so, so what yeah. is going so wrong you can you can you can uh, you can sort of uh, i will, i think it's you can separate the issues of of gradient expansion completely right so think of them as poles in the uh, correlation functions two point functions in uh, in a uh, relativistic qft right so so we have uh, we have relativistic qft which is of course is causal everything is fine right so right and, and, and it has a number of poles, right? These poles will have dispersion relation, right? So, so that's, right. And we are investigating uh, convergence of these dispersion relations, right? So, so by, by any means available, mm -hmm. right? So, so, so that, that, that does not, it's a physical result. I mean, the, the existence of these poles and uh, the, the, the properties uh, uh, of, of the uh, convergence of the appropriate series does not depend on how we formulate relativistic hydro, right? So this this is a property of QFT. Yeah. Okay. Let, right. I don't want to. Go on. Yeah. Okay. We can. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. We, yeah. we can. We can continue this discussion maybe off okay. Uh, okay. Of, yeah. of, 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 offline. But yes, I mean the, the the most important thing here is of course a, a certain assumption about analyticity of the coefficients of uh, of these uh, these spectral curves, which I will come. Uh, to in, in a second. So at any finite order of the gradient expansion, uh, uh, this uh, spectral curve is a polynomial in omega and q squared. 
And moreover, uh, one thing, again, I don't want to go into this, but in principle, you can use equations of, you can use the equations of hydrodynamics to uh, shift various powers of omega and Q from uh, one, um, uh, one order of your expansion to another, as often is done as field redefinitions, right? So you can, you can use equations of motion to do that. But again, so here, I don't want to enter this uh, discussion of the order by order kind of derivative expansion in hydrodynamic contents, right? So suppose we have to, it, uh, this, this, this curve to all orders in omega and Q, as we do in holography, right? Because, because holography provides us this thing to all orders in principle. Right, so uh, what can we say about these complex curves in principle, right? So what can be done with them, right? So complex curves are very interesting objects and I don't know much about them, but uh, uh, there is one property which will be of interest to us. We would like to express, so given a complex curve f of x and y equal to zero, uh, where x and y are complex uh, variables, we want to express y as a function of x, right? We want to solve this. Thing. So, uh, for example, uh, we have this complex curve, uh, which is quintic, right? So y to the fifth and so on equal to zero. And we want to solve this for y as a function of x. So how many, how to do this in general, right? So there's a theory, there is a machinery of how to do this. Uh, so it depends on uh, around which point we want to expand, right? So there are regular points. Regular points are defined by the statement that the, uh, the curve itself at this point is equal to zero, but it's derivative with respect to uh, y because we want to solve y as a function of x, not x as a function of y, is not equal to zero. And then the implicit function theorem guarantees that around this point, you have a convergent Taylor expansion of the standard form y as a function of x minus x star to power n and so on. Now, there are also critical points, the critical points are such that the, uh, well, the curve itself uh, given by equation f is equal to zero, but also the derivatives with respect to this variable y to order p are equal to zero, to order p minus one is equal to zero, and derivative of order p is not equal to zero. So for us, the most interesting case will be then p is equal to one, right? So the first derivative vanishes, but the second doesn't. But in principle, this can be continued to, to any order, all right? Then, uh, in 19th century, people explained to us, uh, right, how to write down the analog of uh, convergent, convergent Taylor series around such points. And this was done by Puzo. And Puzo explained that the series will look like this. So it will be series in fractional powers. And the fractional powers can be determined from the, from the explicit form of the complex curve. There is a machinery of how to do this, which I will not elaborate on. It involves the so-called Newton triangle and all this wonderful mathematics, which again, so I don't want to uh, uh, to go into these details. But uh, in principle, this is a this is a this is a this is an algorithm which is well known for people who work with complex curves. But for us, it's important that this algorithm exists and can be applied to the hydrodynamic curves which we uh, we just uh, discussed, right? So so here is uh, uh, one uh, digression which I cannot resist uh, uh, but pointing out, uh, these issues are quite uh, remarkably uh, showing in uh, uh, such old problems uh, as a motion of planet, planets, uh, uh, Kepler problem, Kepler's law, right? You can notice that Kepler's third law, uh, third law contains non-analyticity, right? The periods are proportional to the fractional power of the uh, major semi-axis, three half. And this is not an accident. So there is a story behind this. But uh, you can so you can look at you can look at this whole uh, story in the following way. So take the uh, motion of a of a planet uh, parameterized by uh, by uh, by the uh, uh, by parameter psi. So this is a parametric form of the of the motion in polar uh, coordinates, which you can uh, take from any uh, textbook on, on on classical mechanics. And uh, this uh, parameter uh, psi, which is known as eccentric anomaly. It determines the position of planets. So it's enough to know psi, uh, and then you substitute, and then you, you, there are formulas which tell you where the planet is on, on the sky. Right? So that's, that's very simple. Now, this equation, t equal to right hand side, is known as the Kepler equation. I rewrote in a slightly different notation, but it's the same equation. So t or normalized tau minus psi plus eccentricity times sine psi is equal to zero. This equation was uh, solved by Lagrange in uh, 1771 in the form of a series. Lagrange apparently was not concerned about the convergence of the series, but Laplace was. So in 1823, he demonstrated 
that the series is actually divergent if eccentricity exceeds a certain critical value, which is known as the Laplace constant. So this is uh, something which points uh, point, uh, uh, 0 0.662733. And, and um, as, uh, as we pointed out by Arnold, so this is a long uh, citation, quotation from Arnold, but I think it's quite remarkable that uh, this equation, the Kepler's equation plays an important role in the history of mathematics. From the time of Newton, the solution has been sought in the form of a series in powers of eccentricity. The series converges when E is less than some number. Investigation of the origin of this mysterious constant led Cauchy to the creation of complex analysis. Right? So, so even knowing Arnold with his uh, yeah, flamboyant uh, style, it's uh, difficult to kind of ignore such statements. And in fact, I, uh, in, when we wrote this paper, I had to actually uh, read a number of uh, original uh, articles very conveniently uh, put online by, by, by the French, by the French Academy of Sciences, I believe, right? So, so all of this is digitized and you can actually read these 19th century journals, right? And it's really remarkable uh, how, yeah, anyways. So, so the, the point is that uh, how, what determines this convergence, right, of the series? Well, uh, you can look at the critical points of the Kepler curve, right? The, the curve is given by this equation, f is equal to zero, right? Then you compute the derivative with respect to psi, right? You have to uh, solve psi as a function of e, right? You have two complex parameters, psi is complex and eccentricity is complex. And then you solve these two equations simultaneously and look at the complex plane of eccentricity. And you discover that there are critical points. There are many of them, but uh, the radius of convergence is determined by the one which is closest to the origin, right? Because you're expanding around e equals zero. And the closest to the origin uh, critical point is exactly this Laplace uh, uh, mysterious constant, except that the critical point is actually located on the imaginary axis, right? So, so this is a this is a rather cute example uh, that shows how to work with the uh, with, uh, with with this uh, machinery in in very simple and familiar situations. So uh, let's apply this uh, to our hydra, right? We have these spectral curves, the shear and the sound one, and uh, we just apply this Piezo Piezo machinery to this. Right, and uh, the Piezo machinery, which again, I admit there is this Newton triangle and so on, you can read in our paper all these details. Uh, uh, it just tells us uh, several things. So it tells us that um, the, there will be two hydro series. One of them is for the shear mode. And this hydro series will come in powers of Q squared because this Piezo machinery determines exactly which power is the power of the expansion. And it tells us something about the coefficients as well. So uh, the moral of the story that uh, so only from the spectral curve you can say that the series must have this form. And there's nothing else. There are no uh, uh, some extra powers of q squared, some non-analytic powers, and so on. So this is uh, this is how it should be. And then for the sound mode, uh, the series must have this this form uh, given given here, right? Where c n and a n are real coefficients. Now. The second statement is that the abstraction to the convergence of this series is the critical point of the spectral curve. So if zero is not a critical point, then the next one, just in the, like in the Kepler problem, the abstraction to the convergence of the series will be the next, to, uh, in, with respect to distance to the origin, the next critical point of the spectral curve. And you don't have to expand the series. You don't have to analyze the coefficients of the series. You just have to look at the spectral curve and analyze the spectral curve, namely the derivative, the first derivative of the spectral curve uh, equal to zero. And this equation tells you the location of all critical points and the one which is the abstraction, right? So, so let's do precisely that. So this is one slide. So now I replace all the slides introducing ADS CFT by uh, the one which was stolen from this wonderful talk by Shamit Kashro in 2019. So this is a holographic duality and I, I won't say anything else about that, right? So, that's, uh, so, so for people who, 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 who do holography, right? So it's all known, right? So how, how we extract spectral curves in, in, in holography? Well, uh, we solve our equations of motion. This can be a rather complicated system of coupled equations, of course, right? So things are not as simple as on this slide, but we all, know in the last 20 years how to, how to work with these uh, things, even in uh, rather complicated uh, situations. And the moral of the story is that the correlators, the retarded correlators, 
uh, proportional to the ratio of coefficients b and a in the solutions of these uh, equations, right? So a equal to zero gives us a spectrum of these normal modes, and it also gives us the spectral curve of our problem, right? So this is the denominator of our uh, correlation function gr. So all we need to do is to set a to zero, right? Uh, having the equation of differential equation, and also set the derivative of a to zero and compute the appropriate critical points of this curve. So obviously this is easy to say, right? So in most cases you have to do it numerically, in fact, almost in all cases, but nonetheless, it's a machinery and uh, we can apply this machinery to the cases which are, we know, right? In, 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 in holographic situations. Sorry, Andre, yeah. I have another question. Yeah. Before, if I understood this correctly, there was one spectral curve for the shear channel and a different one for the sound channel. Yeah. Now there's one spectral curve because I know when you do this, right? No, sorry, this okay. was just an illustration. Uh, okay, I mean, okay. Yeah, sorry. No, of course, yeah, for each channel, there is its own spectral curve and uh, things become even uh, more interesting, shall we say, if we have uh, a coupled system, as you know very well, right? I mean, you, yeah. You, yeah. you you wrote one of these papers uh, dealing with uh, mixed, uh, uh, mixed fields, right? So then, then, so, 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 but, but basically, basically, it's all. Uh, I mean, in, in that case, uh, the spectral curve will be the appropriate determinant, right? So the determinant. Okay. okay. Uh, as yeah, you, as you okay. Thank, thank you. Sorry. Yeah. Right. So this is just an illustration uh, of with one equation. So okay. So so let's look at n equals four supra mills, right? Where the spectrum is known for many years. And uh, we look at the singularities of retarded Green's function in a complex frequency place, uh, plane. So here for the shear channel, right, where we know that there is a hydropole sitting on the imaginary axis. Well, we know the dispersion relation, which is an infinite series, and we want to understand the radius of convergence of this of this series, right? So this is what Ben Vivers was uh, was looking at in his uh, paper in 2018. Except that when you have finite density, then things in some sense are morally uh, simpler because there is a mode in the imaginary axis which collides with this pole and so on. So you can see this mode. Now in n equals four supernatural mills, if you look for real momentum q squared at the spectrum, right? And change your q squared as you like, these guys don't collide, right? Nothing happens to them. So they can move with, with q right around and we know how they move, but, but, but they don't collide, they don't, uh, they don't, uh, yeah, these, uh, they don't, uh, these levels don't cross, right? So, uh, so one may, one may think maybe radius of convergence is, is infinite simply, right? So that's one possibility. So I, I have to explain maybe that um, <clears throat> why the collision is related to, uh, to this uh, uh, notion of critical point, right? So, so recall the condition for a critical point of the curve, right? That the, uh, uh, the function itself uh, uh, of the curve equal to zero and derivative of the function or let's say some number of derivatives are equal to zero. So for example, so this means uh, uh, that this is actually a level crossing condition from quantum mechanics, right? Because uh, what, what does it mean that the derivative with respect to y, for example, is equal to zero? It means that in one of the roots, in one of the roots of the curve, uh, it looks like y minus uh, some function y star to power p. So for example, uh, if, uh, I don't know, if, um, if you have a, uh, if you have a first order, uh, first order collision, then, then uh, you, uh, you would have, uh, sorry, this should be, right, so it should be squared, right? So, uh, so then, then uh, the, the curve itself, right, the derivative with respect to y, right, if, if, if this p is equal to two, right, then the derivative uh, with respect to y will have this, this thing vanishing as well, right? So then, then it means that um, the, the, two, the two branches, right? The, 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 the two branches of the spectral curve, if, you, if, you, if this is a polynomial and you, and you factorize it as a polynomial, the two branches must be equal to each other at a critical point, right? So we expect, we expect uh, omega one at some value of q squared be equal to omega two at, uh, at uh, this, the same value of q squared. Right, so this is a condition of critical point. So this is so-called quasi-normal level crossing, and uh, the um, um, kind of a surprise, if you want, is that uh, it doesn't happen. I mean, let's say it doesn't happen all the time at real cube. It can happen at complex cube. That's that's all, right? So basically, basically, this is this is all we have to 
we have to uh, accept, right? So because at real queue, the dispersion relation are such that these lines don't cross, right? So there is no level crossing at, at real queue, but at complex queue there is, right? So you, you take what you do, you take Q squared as a complex variable, right? Uh, of a given magnitude, and then you vary the phase e to the i phi and you vary the phase. So what happens in the, uh, in the complex frequency plane, for example, this is an example, uh, this is a shared channel with magnitude of Q squared equal to one and you change the phase. So this is your original spectrum with the shear pole sitting on the imaginary axis. And then this Christmas tree guy sitting uh, to the right and to the left, right? These are uh, solid dots. And then you vary the phase and all of them start moving. They start moving counterclockwise and then uh, after two pi, right, they come back to they come back to to the original position. So these are the lines, but they can cross, right? So at small value of magnitude of q squared, they don't, right? It's shown as this picture. But if you increase the magnitude of q squared, eventually they start uh, crossing, and they start crossing. Like this is shown in this uh, figure here, right? So these are red stars. They show, right? So these uh, Christmas tree modes, they follow this kind of uh, complicated Ptolemy trajectories, right? So they have this retrograde motion and uh, rather curious. But the point is that um, at some point, they touch the trajectory of the, of the shear mode pole. <coughs> and if you keep increasing Q squared, they form a happy family of three, right? So on this Q squared equal to 2.23, you see that now, uh, the poles which were isolated on the pre on, on the original picture, right? The shear diffusion pole and the two Christmas tree poles. Now they become one in a sense, right? So they, they interchange their positions on the monodromy. Then, then the phase goes from zero to two, uh, to pi, right? So so the shear mode becomes the Christmas tree pole uh, mode and Christmas tree pole comes to a different position on Christmas tree and, and uh, this left guy comes to, to become the, uh, the pole in the measuring axis. So, this happens. Can I ask a question, please? Sure. Yeah. So, uh, just to point out, I think that, you know, even at finite density, th these collisions happen at complex Q. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, at Q squared. Yes, yes, at Q squared. And even also complex uh, Q squared. Uh, at Q squared equal to negative. Uh, so it. No, no. So, so at complex Q squared in general. So if you look at Christiana. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I will, yes. I will mention this later. Yes, yes. But uh, so, so the, I mean, um, and Q squared is equal to uh, to. Uh, uh, so uh, we will come back to 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 the uh, complex Q squared plane, and then I will uh, I will come on. Okay, thanks. Okay, right. So okay, so 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 this is a uh, yeah. So this is a this is a story, and uh, the same happens in the sound channel, right? So we can. Look again at, at these modes. They they do various complicated things, and um, then uh, um, uh, you can do so. Just to just to emphasize that this is uh, this is nothing more than the quantum mechanical level crossing. Uh, what we can do is to pick a phase, right? So pick a given phase when this uh, uh, crossing or this collision occurs, and plot uh, our spectra. Just as we did on the previous one of the previous slides, right here. So this is the uh, dispersion relation of uh, omega imaginary and real ports as a function of real Q, right, from the old papers. And we can do exactly the same, but now uh, for complex Q squared at a given uh, at a fixed phase. And then we see that uh, there are level crossings, and there are many of them. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, so so this is uh, this is happening at a specific value of q squared, right? And then and then many times, many times later. All right. Um, so um, as Ben, yeah. So so we can look at this as, at these singularities in the complex q squared plane as well, right? Um, so uh, uh, so these are uh, so they, they so the singularities as Puzo tells us, right? They appear in the form of uh, uh, branch points of various degrees, and uh, one can determine actually the degree of the branch point from also from the complex so curve. Um, now, uh, the situation which Ben describes uh, corresponds to uh, 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 the uh, branch point uh, being um, uh, uh, located on the uh, imaginary, uh, sorry, on the real, on the negative real, uh, um, real axis of Q squared. But what I would like to emphasize is that the actual, the one which 
which gives an abstraction to convergence is the closest to the origin, right? So there are many of them in the plane. And moreover, they can move as a function of some parameter if we have some additional parameter like mu over t, right, in, in, in a non-zero density situation or a coupling constant or things like that, right? So, so these guys will move in a complex plane as a function of this parameter. And the one who comes closer to the origin determines the, determines the, the, the radius of convergence, right? So that's, uh, this, is, this is what happens for n equals false super mills, these two pictures, but, um, Again, as uh, as already mentioned uh, uh, by Ben, right at finite density, you can have uh, uh, you can have a, a, a different and even more complicated situation, as was recently investigated in in these two papers, and in particular by uh, uh, Jensen and uh, Pantelido, uh, because uh, yeah, these uh, these guys uh, missed a bit. Uh, yeah, so it's. Uh, it's an interesting story on its own, but but yeah. So so kind of morally speaking, this is a this is a this is the same this is the same uh, situation in the complex Q squared. Okay, so um, Andrea, I think Kesam has a question. Uh, yes. Uh, sorry to interrupt you. Sure. Uh, like I have a maybe a stupid question. When the joining of the modes happening in complex K. I was wondering if it's always in an order that first the hydro mode joined to the lowest non hydro mode and uh, then they join to the other ones, or yeah, it can just, be mm -hmm. uh, yes. like mm -hmm. chaos. Yeah, uh, yes. So uh, uh, the answer is uh, no. Um, and uh, this has been looked at. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, you, can, uh, you can look at the scalar uh, channel of the same. Uh, of the same fluctuations, right? Where you don't have hydro modes at all, right? You so in um, so you can take a minimally coupled massless scalar, right, and in this grounds, right, and, and look at the and look at the critical points, and there you will see that uh, there are no hydro modes to begin with, right? But nonetheless, uh, this phenomena, of course, is happening, right, and uh, and it is happening, uh, it is happening uh, under you know, uh, roughly speaking, in the same spirit as as, as was described, right? Although there are some peculiarities. Which um, I can talk about later. The few again, again in that case, it's like the lowest modes join to each other first, and then the higher modes. Uh, yes, be... yes, yes, yes. Uh, the, the, yeah, the, the, the modes with, with lowest magnitudes, uh, so on top of the complex plane, so to speak, right? So then, then, mm -hmm. uh, then they start doing this, and then it, it, it proliferates below, right? So that's okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I'm uh, I'm close to the end actually. Um, so um, this is a rather simple, uh, uh, simple message if you want, right? So, uh, so what what uh, what was done? So this machinery was applied to n plus four supermills in the holographic limit, right? In the limit of uh, infinite n c, and um, because obviously finite n c, as I mentioned in the beginning, right, will ruin the whole story because it will introduce non-analyticities in the hydro to begin with, right? So that's uh, that uh, actually is an interesting uh, story itself, but. Um, but in the infinite NC limit and uh, uh, infinite lambda, top coupling lambda, the statement is that n equals four super and mills has a finite radius of convergence uh, for the shear mode and for the sound mode. And these radii are given by these expressions here. Um, so, so these are roughly speaking Matsubara frequencies times some number whose origin is. Uh, uh, perhaps mysterious, but they are of order one, so both of them, right? And that's uh, that's a statement. So this uh, this is as much as we know, right? So uh, the one natural question to ask is, um, what happens to these radii of convergence if you change coupling, right? So you 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 have this infinite coupling result, and you may answer, you may ask a question: What happens in kinetic theory? What happens, uh, you can ask the same question, right? So you have, okay, you have dispersion relation. So what is the radius of convergence uh, in weakly coupled uh, uh, gas, right? And, and, and uh, all these things, right? And then the question of interpolating between, uh, between, uh, between, the, two, uh, between the two limits. So um, this question may not be entirely uh, trivial. We thought at the time that it's sort of straightforward, but now, so one can do a crude estimate. The crude estimate is the following. So take the, so we have a, uh, uh, we have a full spectral curve, right? Uh, which is 
which has to be extracted from, from, let's say, from holographic calculations. But we can also write down the same spectral curve based on the hydro expansion. It's a crude approximation because we just we are limited to the first order expansion, for example. But, but nonetheless, why not, right? So, so if we do this, uh, and we know all the ingredients in this expansion for all coupling corrections uh, of these hydro ingredients. So for example, correction to be shared with cost of entropy density was computed many years ago. So uh, we can combine these expansions and at the expense of being very crude, right? Of, of kind of throwing away all the tail, uh, we get the following, right? So the crude estimate gives us for the sound uh, radius of convergence for the sound mode. Uh, will uh, decrease from strong coupling to weak coupling, right? Uh, in the following manner, so it will uh, it will go like one minus some number uh, divided by top uh, coupling to power three half, as all of them go, right? So the minus sign here is kind of suggestive, but uh, let me say that uh, so it appears that the radius of convergence is smaller to weaker uh, coupling, and hydrodynamics and strongly interacting system. Uh, seems to be therefore more robust, right? But before making all these wonderful statements that yes, of course we expected this all along, right? So all the body of evidence tells us that uh, it must be so that Hydra works so well exactly because it's a strongly coupled systems, right? I would, I would actually, I would like to, to have a word of caution because uh, actually this may be a little bit premature. I mean, this statement about this minus, uh, um, I mean, it is correct within these, um, crude approximations, but uh, if we do this honestly, as we are trying to do with, uh, with Peter and Sasha at the moment, then things are actually slightly more complicated. And at the moment, uh, we are not ready to, to say that, yes, this is, this is really, really true, all right? So, so um, let me, uh, I, think, uh, I think we spent too much time on various uh, technical things. So I, uh, uh, I, probably, I probably finish here. Um, and um, you know, because uh, it's also the second part, but <laughs> I think uh, it's uh, it will be responsible to start it. The second part was about the finite coupling, but um, let me not say about this and just finish here. And if there are any questions, then I, I'm happy to answer. Thank you very much, Andre. Um, that was very uh, very good uh, overview of the work done on this. Um, do we have questions? Yeah, uh, hi, Andre. So thanks for the talk. This was very, very interesting. Uh, and I, I would like to ask um, one question. You know, the whole story here reminds me a lot to what uh, in physics we did uh, in the old times with respect to saga quitten theory. We also look to how lines in the complex uh, plane cross uh, and and uh, give a physical interpretation to this uh, to this singular point. Um, so one of the things you can do there is you have the spectral curves and you can define some moduli space and there's there's some uh, some torus you know or more general abelian variety and there's a theory uh, which is this Picard Lefschetz theory which yeah, allows you yeah, to write yeah. Some yeah. sort of differential equations on this model space, and 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 then you see the singularities you see as regular singular points uh, of these differential equations. Is there a similar story here? With this, this would presumably be differential equations with very very high order of derivative, right? Yes. Uh, so uh, the honest answer is I don't know. I I tried to. I mean, this Picard Lefschetz thing is is rather suggestive. Uh, Kind of in, in in applications to to these uh, to these matters, uh, I, uh, I I'm not sure I have anything of substance to say, but it's only because my uh, my knowledge of these matters is unfortunately is extremely limited I mean, from mathematical point of view. Um, I uh, I know so uh, there is one sort of rather simple, but to me it's a painful question. Uh, which, in fact, maybe somebody of the audience in the audience can can immediately resolve. Uh, you see, in this language, the very existence of the hydra, because we can ask a question: when? So, for a given theory, so for a given Lagrangian, 
when does a Hydra regime exist at all? Right? Just, just, just a priori, right? Can you can you say that there is a regime, right? Which which is related to the fact that uh, to the question whether the radius of convergence for let's say Hydra modes is non-zero at all, right? So is it is it is it non -zero? And 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 this is in holographic contents. It's simply a statement of uh, whether the dependence on the um, so whether the solution because the, the spectral curve ultimately is the solution of the ODE gotcha. at a given point, at a fixed point, at the boundary, right? There is nothing else. And it's function of parameters. Now, the dependence on parameters is known from the equation. And usually, it is smooth, right? So usually, we control this. So suppose we know that the dependence is analytic on the parameters. Can we say something about analyticity of a, a, a value of the solution of ODE at zero, for example, immediately from that. If we can, then it's a statement that holography knows that, for example, a theory such and such has a Hydra regime, right? We have mm -hmm. a non-zero because if a function is analytic, it is analytic in some vicinity, right? It cannot be analytic. analytic so it has non-zero radius convergence of some, some kind, right? It may be very small, but, but nonetheless, it, it, it's, it's, it's non-zero. Right and and uh, yeah, so this is related to basically this uh, simple statement in the theory of uh, of uh, ordinary differential equations. And uh, to my shame, I I, I really cannot uh, cannot have a have an answer because that that would that would be a proof of existence of the Hydra uh, approximation in a given theory with hologra with, with with gravity dual. Right, so plain and simple. That, that in principle would be an interesting statement. A priori, it's not guaranteed that a given theory has a high regime. Okay, thank you, thank you. If I, I'm, just a very quick question for the related for that. Matthias is a boss. Mm -hmm. so. Um, so, so far, you know the spectral curves here. They are they are uh, they are. Uh, co-dimension one in a in 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 a complex in a complex two-dimension space, right? And so, if you have uh, you know two modes, basically, that you know there are two lines in in, and they have to cross somewhere, right? Um, now, and I think this this point which you showed, these were precisely such crossing points, right? Where two modes collide, um, but there there are these higher critical points where yes. modes like come together and touch. And so, do they have some specific physical interpretation? Have you encountered anything like this? In, in um, yeah, that's uh, again. It's a question which I, I'm afraid I cannot fully answer. So in our paper, we have this section uh, which is related to this um, uh, to this story of chaos, right? And and uh, the um, uh, Paul Skipping and, and and things like that. Uh, but um, I I'm probably out of four offers. I'm probably the, 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 on the conservative side of this uh, story. Uh, so let me let me not say anything about that. But but nonetheless, so you 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 know very well, right? So there are these mysterious connections to uh, of of Hydra modes at large values of Q uh, to 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 the uh, to Lyapunov exponents to to chaos and and uh, these um, yeah these things. So so from that perspective, uh, maybe maybe there is a there is a connection of uh, of a higher maybe, maybe there is a there is a story. In fact. The whole distribution of these singularities in the complex Q squared plane uh, may be of some interest generically, right? So, what exactly? I mean, how do they behave in general? So, for we just looked at very simple. Um, I mean, we computed to maybe two or three of them, right? And but but it's very easy to to see what they do in a complex plane and whether or not they are related to any properties of the underlying QFT, as mm -hmm. for example, this chaos story uh, shows. But uh, we 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 have nothing substantial to say on this at the moment. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have other questions? Anybody? Okay, so um, Okay, good. Um, 
Well, then I would say we can close the official part um, of this uh, this session. I thank uh, Andre again, and what we'll, like as usual, we will stop the recording. And everybody who would like to stick around a little bit um, for informal discussions uh, is welcome to do that. Everyone else, thank you for participating, and see you next week.